Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and, we hope, common purpose. At MIT, CAS partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAS facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and in which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Welcome. My name is Caroline Jones, and I'm an art historian teaching in history, theory, criticism section of the Department of Architecture here at MIT. This is my recorded introduction to the first of two sessions on the theme of open systems in the Unfolding Intelligence Symposium hosted by the Center for Art, Science, and Technology. This event is also supported by the Transmedia Storytelling Initiative. Our recorded presentations will be followed by a live discussion and Q&A. I want to thank Mellon postdoc Will Lockett and CAST director Leela Kinney for making this symposium a reality during the long tail of a pandemic, assisted by Catherine Higgins as the Open Systems Session producer. We will be holding the second part of our session this evening at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I do hope that those listening might be able to come to both so that we can have the kind of cumulative and collaborative conversation that we so miss from pre-pandemic times. Please feel free to ask any questions during this webcast. On the webpage, you'll find links to the entire symposium. Our colleagues at the List Visual Arts Center are also hosting related events on the future of AI that I hope you can visit. We joke about the fire hose of information at MIT, and this week of events is no exception. I want to begin my brief introduction by speaking the words of MIT's recently achieved land acknowledgement. Although we gather virtually, the resources and capacities of the Institute come from being a land-grant university based on the ongoing occupation, settling, and colonization of existing people's land. MIT acknowledges indigenous people as the traditional stewards of this land, recognizing the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation, among others. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples connected to this land from time immemorial. Acknowledging the living indigenous communities here in Massachusetts is important to me, and this evening's session will open directly onto questions of indigenous epistemologies of kinship, in machinic and earth systems, framed in biology as mutualism, in our ecologies and algorithms in our machine learning prostheses. But this morning's session is quite different. I have set our two extraordinary speakers a different charge since they both operate 
out of Northern Europe and deal with those cultural imaginaries on a daily basis. First, let me introduce them briefly and then explain the somewhat challenging charge that I gave them for today's conversation. I first came to know Lars Bang Larsen through his very clever anthology, Networks, issued in 2014. But this prolific curator critic has also issued other edited volumes. The 2014 Phantoms of Liberty, Fundamentalisms of the New Order in 2018, and two different versions of the new model in 2020. I sought out artist Yena Sutla in 2018 after seeing her extraordinary performance, Extremophile, at the Serpentine Marathon, in which the clean suit she wore served as the backdrop for the projection of an amazing film about our relations and sonic meditations um, on our interplanetary relations with extremophile bacteria. In 2019, I was thrilled to learn that Lars was organizing an exhibition, Mud Muses, that would include Yenna's work. The Moderna Museet exhibition is named for the composition of bubbling mud that I'm showing you here by earlier art and technology artist, Robert Rauschenberg. Riffing on Rauschenberg's expansive and improvisatory aesthetic, Lars encouraged us to think about technology not as a 20th century thing of electronics and metal, or a 21st century thing of algorithms, but courtesy of Ursula Le Guin's rant about technology, mobilizing her expanded definition of technology as the active human interface with the material world. In this case, mining mud, but in Yenna's case, imaginary magma bubbling inside a series of activated lava lamp glass heads molded from her own countenance. Yenna then used machine learning to read the random shapes morphing in the heads for several other compositions I'm sure they'll be talking about. Sutta's work has been featured at art museums and contexts internationally, including Guggenheim Bilbao in Lars's show at Moderna Museet and in an upcoming exhibition and edition of Eflux. I'm happy that she accepted our invitation to be a visiting artist here at MIT, despite COVID, and I'm sure she'll talk about the work she's doing with my physicist colleague, Marcus Buhler, in her upcoming conversation with Lars. The AI that Yena Sutala deploys can riff on the chemical and kinetic activity of molecules on their larger aggregation in primordial organisms or on the fluid dynamics of psychedelic wax. To get out of the way of their discussion, I'll cut to the chase. I knew that Lars was the right intellectual to draw Yena out on the subject of an alternative definition of AI as alien intelligence. From the intelligence of the poorly understood gut brain of the microbes that govern our human moods to the intelligence of other than human entities in the universe. For me, open systems implies opening out intelligence to these different kinds of forms that might be machinically more than human or organically multi-species or cosmically other. The question that unites this morning and this evening session is how opening our machinic systems to these questions of alien or more than human cognition really raises the stakes of our fantasies of computers as potentially sentient entities. If artificial intelligence so closely modeled on humans is seen as alien instead, we have to do a lot more work to figure out how it operates and how it culturally signifies. I was inspired by Sutada's work with slime molds as models for distributed cognition and by Lars's encyclopedic knowledge of popular culture tropes, to ask them to consider alien intelligence as prefigured in Cold War science fiction, which might have been particularly intense in Sutala's native Finland on the border between the Soviet Union and its NATO counterparts. If illustrators of H.G. Wells imagined how his Martians as spidery or octopoid aliens, zapping people through electric wires and transformers coming out of their bodies, the post-nuclear imaginary of aliens became distinctly humanoid. These hairless, big-eyed, cranial, domed, scarily sentient aliens appeared during the atomic age, fueled by U.S. nuclear weapons testing in the Nevada desert, 
as well as uh, mano a mano with Soviet underground nuclear tests in the mutually assured threat of biocidal destruction. I thought Lars was just the person to excavate the bizarre links that I can intuit between Eastern Bloc cybernetic theorists such as the urban designer Branko Petrovich, whose effluent man of 1971 seems uncannily prescient of our ET-like tropes of greenish-white embryonic creatures of unknown intention. Since Lars put Petrovich into one of his recent exhibitions, he's more qualified than most to talk with Yena about this weirder side of how we model cybernetic modes of future intelligence. And in Sutala's work, this feedback looping can embrace slime molds as well as lava heads exhibiting more than human cognitive facilities. Months ago, when I invited them to join this symposium, I particularly challenged these profoundly creative individuals to explore the whiteness of AI in the figure of the powerful Cold War alien. It's not easy to situate Yenna's gorgeous crystal heads with their color-sorted magma into discourses of race, particularly when work such as Extremophile and Holobiont are explicitly engaged with swarm cognition in bacteria that might have 700 sexes and no capacity to be raced at all, at least not so far. But to invoke the alien in US discourse is to engage the atomic age fantasies of a superior, perhaps sinister, possibly beneficent, but in any case, dominating humanoid. Concepts of intelligence that track with deeply biased algorithms in white favoring tech. So while it's not required that Lars and Yenna unpack this complex for those of us here in the US, I'd be grateful if they could, in their brilliant conversation, agree to talk with me about this matter after their recorded presentations are concluded. An aid to our discussion might be found in the recent work of artist Ryan Kuo, who trenchantly questions the way whiteness functions on our screens as a kind of default subject position. His computational works emerge as apps, websites, and occasionally videos. Shown here is a still from his work, OK. Also pertinent is the fully complex meditation he calls pointer. To sum up this challenge to the alienating effects of our AI with a final bit of my own meditation on computation's whiteness, I remind you that the pointer finger originated in the animated gloved hand of Mickey Mouse from early American cinema, itself a remnant of the live minstrel show in which white performers appropriated black song and dance. This in turn became the cute little pixelated hand of another kind of mouse only 50 years later, the navigational computer mouse whose clicks and drags are now harvested by AI from our networked computers. Yena Sutala, by moving to the radical alterity of bacterial movements to train machine learning, obviously avoids the algorithmic bias built into human speech recognition, and not to mention the racial bias built into facial recognitions, incapacities, and homophilies, echo chambers. Creating software to construct Martian glossolalia and a beautiful illegible script from divinings of microbial movement and machine learning. Sutella's take on the whiteness of AI may well intend to skip the cultural baggage of human imaginaries altogether, seeking the absolute open system of a planet, not our own. Let us turn the screen over to Lars and Yena for their conversations on open systems, and I'll rejoin after the endpoint so that we can take questions and have a discussion with you, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, uh, and thank you for the invitation to hear it unfolding and tell it uh, I'll just say that for our conversation, and as Jena knows, I framed my questions to a work around a simple genealogy of Western esoteric countercultures. So my questions take the starting point and elements of witchcraft, spiritualism, and psychedelia that can be found in Jena's work and research. Now, esoterica, 
uh, can be broadly defined as um, embodied other knowledges and knowledge of others or as embodied other intelligences and intelligence of others. And that's including more than human others, of course, whether they're ghosts or aliens or more abstract entities such as fields of energy and other imperceptible agents and arenas of being. It's in this sense that uh, haunting has become an indispensable attitude to history. Cultural theorist Carla Fracero writes that, quote, to assume the perspective of the ghost foregrounds the imperative issuing from the other in the labor of the historian, unquote. So a historical space that is haunted by a traumatic and violent past can be opened up untold ways that potentially refashion social relations and upend what we think we know. Um, it must also be said that what I broadly call Western esoterica also has proven to be um, politically unstable and ambiguous. Esoterica tends to bring institutional chaos with it, and certain forms of it have historically been employed to legitimize oppressive regimes. So our conversation on open systems and on Vienna's work revolves around what you could call political ecologies of historical knowledges that have, uh, that were or are inimical or marginal to the modern constitution from the other's point of view. And our conversation will deal with uh, techniques that have been employed by countercultural groups to produce system errors in the program of Western modernity, often by means of what Gloria Anfaldua has called spiritual activism. Witchcraft, spiritualism and psychedelia are counter traditions within empire. They're not situated outside of, of empire, but at its limits. And as such, they can be tested against the principle of epistemic disobedience that Walter Mignolo sees as a prerequisite for decolonization. We'll start with witchcraft. And uh, there is a web of patriarchal domination that connects the development of capitalism, colonialism, and the repression of women. In her amazing book, Caliban and the Witch from 2004, Silvia Federici shows how primitive accumulation took shape in the Middle Ages in the form of the capitalist order's colonial expansion for the purpose of building an entirely new economy in the so-called New World, uh, an expansion that was combined with the subsumption of women into the social reproduction. Uh, the witch hunts in Europe implied a continental femicide, and with this, the eradication of other knowledges which women as carers and knowers of communities had been primary carriers. In this way, patriarchy demonized witchcraft as a gender transgression into the realm of the more than human. Magic remedies were means of such transports. Thus, in 17th century Denmark, witches' pharmacopoeia included fecal pancakes with which you could supposedly transfer vitality from a healthy person to the weak and ill. And this act of consuming feces uh, was, of course, considered an attack of, on the values of the Lutheran Church. But it can also be seen to represent an entirely different organization of the relation between the human and the more than human. And Jenna, it's from you that uh, I have this story of Danish fecal pancakes. I know that previously you have worked with God Machine poetry, but fecal pancakes, how do they factor into your work? Yeah, so I've been really curious about that particular piece of Danish history and the pancake remedy, which feels closely related to uh, fecal microbiota transplants, a form of bacteriotherapy that I've been studying as part of my residency at uh, MIT. And yeah, as the story goes, there was a case of witchcraft reported on the island of Bornholm in 1679, where a pancake had nearly poisoned a farmhand. And the court documents reveal that at the core of this case was actually an attempt to cure a sickly child by transferring crafter or vitality from another healthy child born at the same time. And the transfer was to happen through pancakes made from the feces of the healthy child in the size of a hen's egg, apparently. Uh, unfortunately, the pancakes didn't work to cure the child and they were accidentally fed to a farmhand 
who then reported it. Uh, and during the trial, it was revealed that this practice had been common to the region in earlier times. And I've also read about an even deeper history of fecal transplants in fourth century China for the treatment of food poisoning. Uh, anyway, what I'm mostly interested in are the possible mental health benefits of such bacterial therapies, the connection between uh, the microbiome and our thoughts and emotions, the ability of excrement to cure depression in particular, and it certainly feels like some kind of a circle is closing when the most prominent method, methods for treating depression seem to be excrement and, and ketamine at the moment. And another suggested method is to breathe uh, mycobacterium vacca from the soil while gardening. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that we're more bacteria than so-called human cells. As, as Donna Haraway put it, to be a one at all, you must be a many. Um, in my work on the gut-brain axis, I'm exploring this kind of multiplicity as an alternative to individuality. Uh, also, the idea that through fecal transplants or pancakes, we can accommodate the bacteria of others. I, I really want to um, celebrate our commingling with bacteria and, and human bodies as connected environments. Um, I've encountered some fascinating projects at the at the campus, uh, stool-based biobanks and that focus on collecting and preserving the biodiversity of human gut microbes for future generations. Um, astrobiologists studying coprolites, sewage epidemiology and, and this sort of stuff. <clears throat> right. Um, we should go on to spiritualism. Because in uh, in spiritualism, in nineteenth century spiritualism, there is a history of uh, automation uh, that that is hidden in there. You could say so. Spirit mediums, especially young women, were understood to be capable of entering into contact with the spirits of the dead. The medium was a channeler, uh, a receiver of messages from the other side, as it were, messages to be broadcast to the living. And in this way, the uh, the medium was seen as a, as a telesubject, to put it like that, someone with enhanced connectivity. Uh, this idea of the medium as a conduit between worlds led to practices of automatic writing in which the conscious subject takes the backseat and supposedly allows for someone or something else, another intelligence, to, uh, to take control. Now, as an... Um, unholy mix of science and religion. Spiritualism had an affirmative relation to new technology. So for instance, in 1854, there was a group of uh, spiritualists who petitioned the US Congress for funding to develop a so-called uh, spirit telegraph. And that's a kind of super powerful telegraph for communication with the spirits of the dead. Uh, they didn't get the funding, I can reveal, but that's Congress for you, isn't it? Um, but now, Jena, your work, um, Nimia City, I, I guess it's pronounced, is based on uh, the 19th century Swiss medium Helen Smith's automatic writing and oral transmissions, which she herself referred to as communication with Martians in Martian language, so in a non human alien language. For this project, you um, collaborated, you could say, with uh, the wonderfully named bacteria Bacillus subtilis, which is found in uh, the human gut, but it's also been taken on space flights to Mars to test the limits of life. So in your work, Nemia, sorry, Nemia Setii, uh, an AI generated a script based on observations of the activity of the bacteria and a neural network trained on your voice produced sound to match the configuration of bacteria. Over time, the machine learning process developed a language of its own and became capable of writing. And just to explain, you recorded with your own voice whatever you could find of Smith's writing, thus interpreting or bastardizing Smith's uh, Martian language with your own voice. Uh, and this was used to teach the AI. Um, yeah, so my question about Nimia Setii is, 
why do we need an entirely new language or for which new community do we need? Um, in, the, in the words of uh, Madeleine Jins and Arakawa, we must forget language and all those mechanisms that structure us via via the world and so stutter our way to divinity. And um, a lot of my recent work has been interfering with language or trying to sense the world in some other way. Um, that's because I find it difficult to truly collaborate with life forms with which we don't share a language. And, and yet I'd like to do just that. that. Um, my friend uh, Kay Alida McDowell recently wrote the book uh, Pharmaco AI together with OpenAI's neural net language model, GPT-3. Uh, they describe the writing process as experimentation with a language ecology that's not limited to human meaning. And I really relate to this type of uh, linguistic project. Thank you. Time is running. I can, I can tell we should, uh, we should jump to psychedelia. <laughs> which another topic that's on the edge of the symbolic order. Um, uh, and this, um, this concerns your new project, Wet on Wet, uh, which is a collaboration through MIT's Center for Art, Science and Technology. Here you work with uh, the material scientist, Marcus J. Bueller, who has developed a method for expressing molecular vibrations in audible space. And of course, vibrations or the vibe was uh, an archetypal trope of 60s counterculture, as we know from the Beach Boys song about good vibrations. But together with Bueller, you've compiled a sonic toolkit for amplifying the waves of emotional molecules in domestic waters. Mm -hmm. And this is inspired by Masaru Emoto's idea about water as a blueprint for our reality and how different emotional energies and vibrations can change the physical structure of water. Uh, wet on wet sounds like uh, hydrofeminism that meets speculative materialism in a kind of nano synesthesia. Um, uh, uh, the theorist Steve Goodman has said that uh, human audition is a fold on the vibratory continuum of matter. Uh, so human audition is not isolated to one modality, one kind of perception, but touches other senses and induces other material responses. Um, to begin with, could you just briefly explain what are these emotional molecules that you work with? Uh, so Marcus and I work with seven molecules, the love and bonding hormone oxytocin, the neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, uh, the energy carrying ATP, a growth factor, and an antibody. And yeah, the first outcome of the project will be a video where one can hear and see visualizations of molecular vibrations that are resonating in this kind of uh, Waldorf st style, <laughs> wet on wet painting that I have been doing for lockdown meditation and the sonified molecules are imprinted on the surface of water using an acoustic transducer. Uh, additional patterns are generated by a neural network that has learned from the molecular ripples and, and is now seeing them everywhere. Um, yeah, and you referred to the, to the domestic waters and since the work will initially be presented online and experienced at home, I'm hoping to make it more tangible or felt by encouraging people to amplify the presence of these so-called emotional molecules in their domestic environments through programming the molecular vibrations into water for yeah, painting, drinking, cooking, bathing, fermenting, farming, watering plants, etc. Um, one will be able to do this by taking a thin glass vessel with a small amount of water inside and placing the vessel on their mobile phone while it's playing the sound of a molecule um, in the video. And the idea comes from Masaru Emoto's experiments, which you also refer to, among other esoteric practices around water memory or, or dosing water with uh, spiritual potentials. 
um, the topic of sonifying microscopic, even nanoscale phenomena is very interesting to me, um, observing life by listening instead of only looking. Um, Marcus will actually join me in a breakout session tomorrow to talk more about his method. Uh, before I met Marcus, I, I had also been in discussion with uh, physicist Jim Jimsevsky, who is known for his work on sonocytology at the UCLA, and particularly for the screaming yeast uh, that's, uh, that anthropologist Sophia Roos, who I also met here on the campus, has written so well about. Um, Jim Sevsky is basically using the tip of a microscope like a needle on a record, and, and the record so far has consisted of yeast cells. Great. Just to, uh, to get back to the political ecologies, I have a, a long, difficult question. Um, again, my, my, my starting point is, is the idea of, of, of the vibration or, yeah, the good vibration, because in, in 60s counterculture, the, the vibe was conceived as something more than audible, right? It was uh, the virtuality of the tremble uh, that had to be picked up, as it were. Uh, more than heard, actually. So, so for those who were tuned in and experienced and in the know, the vibe was conducive to a special kind of uh, of fluid subjectivity uh, uh, that could open up to any becoming, any transformation, supposedly. Uh, so, in relation to uh, wet on wet, this is something that you uh, that you link to, you 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 conceptualize through. Uh, a discussion of uh, oceanic feelings uh, as a sense of oneness with the world or a limitlessness. Uh, so on a neurochemical level, you point out, and now I'm quoting you, this feeling, quote, is triggered by the love and bonding hormone oxytocin. The oceanic has the potential to unsettle subjectivity. It can be a point of departure for new social and political models that do not rely on discrete selves, unquote. So I'm wondering about the, the oceanic as a political concept. Uh, already Freud was uh, troubled by the identification of religious feeling as uh, something limitless. Um, uh, what if you don't feel part of this indissoluble bond of being one with the external world, he wrote. Um, and in um, and in in the 1960s, as uh, historian of architecture Felicity Scott points out, countercultural claims to oceanic feelings operated not as the welcoming of strangers, but at the expense of politics. So, if we follow Freud and Felicity Scott, the oceanic feeling rather undermines political encounters, uh, at least political encounters that are premised on self-conscious decisions. Uh, this can be contrasted with that part of, of 60s counterculture that wasn't premised on oceanic universalism, namely uh, the Black Power movement that rejected the idea of universalism and instead advanced the claim of uh, particularism. Today, theorists such as Jane Bennett and Bruno Latour and others are perhaps more on the oceanic side of things. Uh, for instance, when Jane Bennett emphasizes uh, distributed agency and what she calls uh, the pub uh, a public as the product of conjoint action. So my question <laughs> is, you know, wh why do you use the concept of uh, the oceanic and how can we use this concept today without falling into the traps uh, outlined by Freud and missed by the hippies? And, and how does the oceanic translate to, to current political concerns and, and concepts? So I've been focusing on interspecies alliances and, and rethinking humanity in a material and worldly setting. I was always inspired by uh, geologists Diana and Mark McMenamin's idea about the hypersea according to which terrestrial organisms are bonded by their commingling body fluids and that together form a sea through which other organisms and nutrients can move. 
And similarly, Astrid Nymanis writes about the flow and flush of waters that sustain our own bodies, but also connect them to other bodies and to other worlds beyond our human selves. I, I'd like to think of the oceanic as a common identity that can help us act together for the advancement of collective and also beyond human interest. And of course, we should work towards distributing the future evenly, both socially and environmentally speaking, and, and finding university uh, unity in diversity or, or the particularities that you mentioned. Um, I remember this lecture by Rosi Prairotti in Kassel some years ago, um, where she asked, since when was human an all-inclusive category and, and continued that she'd rather run with the bacteria. Uh, right at the unpack, the, the kind of overinflated image of human as the measure of all things, pointing out how even the concept of post-human fails to really stand for post-power, post-class, post-gender, post-race. And she called into question how that which is, which is human depends on a process of exclusion and that we were not all human to begin with. Mm. Great, thank you. I think that's a, a great note on which to finish. And I guess our time is up now as well. I'll see you in the discussion. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that was fantastic. Um, I wish we were in the same, yeah, I wish we were breathing the same molecules, but we were having to transduce ourselves through a comprehensive set of algorithms running Lars over Zoom, Yena over the web interface. I don't know where I am. I want to just hone in on this beautiful place that you ended us with, Yena. And, you know, could, could AI, yeah, could we possibly turn this human addled biased set of algorithmic languages um, and machine learning protocols into some sort of oceanic connector? I mean, th this is the this is the task in some sense of the entire symposium. What are the promises of AI? What are the perils of AI? I chose to highlight your engagement with AI as alien, but it is this incredibly powerful connector for you in your work. So maybe, maybe you could help us think about that as your own very creative problem and very creative process. How do you engage the machine learning algorithms as both alien and as both connecting you to others? Uh, yes, first of all, I didn't manage to give my thanks in the recorded session, so here it goes. <laughs> thank you, Caroline, for the invitation and, and thank you, Cast, for having me as a resident artist and, and happy to be talking with you, Lars and, and Caroline, <laughs> today live. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of my recent work explores these kinds of um, ghosts in the machines of our creation. Um, for example, the, the, the so-called black box problem in machine learning means that it's sometimes hard to explain how an AI has come to its conclusions. So, and on the one hand, the work uh, such as Nini Aseti or Imagma is about getting in touch with the non-human condition of the computers that work as our interlocutors and infrastructure. But on the other hand, it's also about the computers escaping their human origins and, and getting in touch with themselves and the more than human world around them. So, so I've I've been exposing the, the machines to bacterial movements, um, randomness in, in a bubbling kombucha tea culture, uh, which consists of, a, of this symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast, or most recently ripples based on vibrations from the sounds of molecules. So I guess there's this sort of idea about um, uh, could machines have some sort of embodied cognition 
because I've been like Caroline also mentioned uh, or you mentioned in the introduction um, I've been looking into the microbiome or the the composition of microorganisms living in our guts and and their effects on our our thoughts and emotions um, so so I somehow wanted to move some sort of thinking <laughs> from this territory to to the realm of machines as well um, and I'm not sure if I'm, I'm fully answering it was a big question <laughs> also about yeah, connecting well, I think it's I think there are many questions and we can just keep keep going with them I mean Lars brought so many beautiful writers to all of these questions he can probably also jump in with some references for us but um, I love the black box problem. And when I wrote a question to start us off, I was actually thinking of a computer scientist, Judah Pearl, who tells us we should be frightened because the place that machine learning has gone with so-called deep learning, where it, where it teaches itself, is no longer comprehensible to computer scientists. In other words, they see the outcome, <laughs> but they don't know as scientists how to trust it because they no longer understand the steps the machine took to get that answer, All right? So for computer science, the black box is a very serious place of anxiety. Um, and it's also a place of science fiction, this singularity, you know, the machine general intelligence that's going to happen and so on. What I love about your responses and, and your processes is that they come down to these quite specific projects of translation where you're actually interested in the alien operations of the machine, you know, in, in what, what patterns it will find that are different from the ones, ones you can. So I, I, I mean, I encourage Lars to come in on this idea of the black box and particularly Lars with the provocation at the end, which is where, you know, how do black boxes relate to black power? So, you know, the, um, <laughs> the, the black community is very actively rewriting algorithms, right? And they're very dedicated to uh, putting human difference back in something like a sentencing algorithm, which is supposedly determining on the basis of past patterns, whether that human should go to prison or not, right? So in other words, it's a very active social area of programming. Um, and yet for engineers, the black box is supposed to be, you know, absolutely neutral and objective. So by, by, by applying the AI to some sort of fluids, you know, you're insisting on AI as a way of connecting between difference. Anyway, so I'm just surfacing this massive tangle hoping maybe Lars can start us off with untangling it. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> that, that was a big arc <laughs> you were taking there. But, but I, I think your question is about, uh, about you know, how, how to connect uh, through something also dissociate us. Uh, that's a problem of mediation. Well, and that's, that's where many of these questions land, obviously. To um, to start, in, like you did yourself in your introduction, in the twentieth century, I think the uh, the the for of the black box uh, is is the of it, it's 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 of the mainframe computer, or it, these uh, uh, it's yeah. close to what we, we are. Thinking. We are getting right now. We are getting a kind of a total word salad out of you, <laughs> a word salad. <laughs> made out of the garden, the cybernetic garden you're trying to conjure for us. Um, I wish we had, you know, I wish you could like type some of these uh, aperçu for us because we're, we're literally kind of getting every third word, which is the machine's decision about what we should be able to hear from you. Sorry. <laughs> but it, it's all good. It's all good. We're starting to get some, some questions from um, the audience and I want to bring those in too, because those are, those are precious parts of our community. So one question got named. So I'm just going to tell the audience that like they get farther if they put their name on it. So Matthew Ritchie, who's also part of this symposium 
says proposing a division between the oceanic or immersive and the particular seems to miss out on the concept of the coastal community. Bridging the space between the particular and the commons through highly localized technologies and practical edge farming practices. So the, the, the question coming out of that comment is, can we find an ethics on the technologies of edges? I don't know where you want to take that poetically, but that's, that's the question. You know, that's also a sculptor's, a sculptor's question, Yana. So, you know, you've made, you've made different kinds of edges for slime mold to navigate. Um, and then there's, of course, a disciplinary component because they're the edges of disciplines that we might try to dissolve. In any case, that's Matthew's con contribution to the conversation. And perhaps this somehow goes back to the, the particularities that, that we were talking about with, with Lars as well, if I, if I understand the, the question right, that it's um, about things not fully blending in, but also appreciating the, <laughs> the edges or particularities. Uh, if, I, if I understand it, it right. So for example, like, um, I'm not sure if this is going into the, the right direction, but, but I, was, I was thinking how um, um, with, this, with this idea of the hypersea or being connected aquatic environments uh, uh, through our bodies um, and, and, and wanting to be kind of a, a good, good host to <laughs> say the bacteria that, that live in us and move through us and live in other bodies and, and so on, but uh, we should also uh, think about, for example, the the, the network, the the human, and and uh, and more than human network that that this uh, that we really need to host to, and and to consider the most uh, efficient ways to to sort of uh, benefit different kinds of particularities and and uh and different cultural bacterial and living conditions um some of them uh, compromised um yeah so so I, I i just kind of read this question i don't know if i'm really going into a totally other other field that may be kind of similar to the interspecies relations that I've been dealing with, the, the, the survival of the fittest narrative won't do also in, <laughs> in uh, even human relations or... or um, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, operations. the oceanic, I think the oceanic, which is a metaphor that, um, that you offered us, is proving to be really stimulating for the crowd. And we just subtracted Lars's video in hopes that it'll strengthen his bandwidth here. Um, but but Will Lockett, who's been the Mellon postdoc helping us, you know, conjure this entire symposium, Will wonders about how Kaya Silverman, you know, media theorist, sees the oceanic as a kind of um, useful analogy uh, that also brings us into an affinity uh, with the past that might be problematic, but Will wants to take this in a more generous kind of hospitality direction that you're now suggesting. Is, is our AI more analog now in its kind of receptivity to human impulses and intuitions? And can we render it thereby more susceptible to some of our troubled pasts and some of our troubled relationships to our past? Can we make it more permeable uh, to its own biases that we've baked into it might be another way of putting it. And, and Lars, we can't see you, but if you have something to say, just blurt it out. <laughs> me. Hear me? Wow. We're hearing little bits of you. Little, <laughs> little but, but, hello, hello. Yeah. Hello? I'm not coming we through. We heard hello, hello. And <laughs> yeah, you're still hearing? Are you still picking up? Oh, 
Yes, we've got our, our ocean. The oceans between us are proving extremely non-communicable. Communicable. Uh, um, but maybe Yana, you want to pick up Will's question about whether whether you experience AI. I mean, you've had quite a bit of artistic engagement with machine learning and with co the computational as metaphor and as technology. Would you would you say that you're finding a little bit more permeability now to this interface that might make it more open to some of our own troubles and differences? Mm. Certainly, I think we should should strive to or, or strive to that end, and and I'm uh, hopeful in terms of uh, art. Uh, giving some space to these sorts of experiments and, and the possibility to to feed in uh, critical, also useless content uh, to the, these intelligent machines. Um, and I've certainly been surprised by machine learning algorithms in the, the recent years, uh, this, this, this black box that, that we've been talking about, I, I feel, if even though I knew what I fed into the machines, it's always been the results have often been eerie, uh, strange, something that I didn't expect. Uh, I've often I've also been in this kind of poetic uh, troubles of having to dumb down <laughs> the algorithms because otherwise they would become too boring because they're too uh, too smart, so so to say, or or, or they see world too too clearly too much like us um things like this but but uh but but i'm uh, on my own, own behalf at least i'm <laughs> i'm trying to um use my my position uh and and the possibility to use some of these uh, machine learning algorithms uh, towards uh, making some sort of useless strange um cuts in there or, or, or inserts, you should say, probably. Yeah. Well, I love in your work how each project wants to be applied in multiple forms with phone interfaces and, you know, a video and possibly, uh, you know, something more immersive. So maybe um, you and Lars might have some thoughts about the you know, post COVID, the kind of the spatial interface with the kind of vibrational AI that you're now exploring, the vibrational machine learning that you're now exploring in wet on wet. Do you, you imagine a real time interface of that with, with a person in their kitchen with some water and an iPhone, hopefully not directly in the iPhone, but you know, some kind of mediated uh, interface is that something you'd want to just forecast for us about how you see that work going forward and whether AI gives you permission to do some of these uh, stranger things with these molecules that Marcus wants us to believe in? <laughs> uh, certainly, I hope so. And, and um and as as far as the the multiple media of the work and and especially at a time like this when when a lot of work thoughts uh emotions somehow need to be channeled through <laughs> online interfaces uh via via machines and 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 so on i tried to find ways to to use for example sound is a pretty good medium in that that those terms that it travels <laughs> travels uh, well uh, through wires and 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 still can create a very rich experience, um, a very emotionally and and embodied experience in the the receiver, and and I've been thinking about all these uh, home rituals, like for example the the sort of programming, the esoteric programming of water with these uh, vibrations or or molecular frequencies that we've been working on with Hello. Marcus. Uh, ah, I hear Lars. Yeah, Lars. <laughs> oh. We hear you <laughs> Sorry. momentarily. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, come on no, in. No. We've got about we've got about five minutes left in the discussion. 
And if we can hear you, Lars, I'd love to have your thoughts. A lot of the commentary is coming in. Mohammed Aboud wonders about, you know, the machinery of code structuring, whether you ever get into the black box, you know, uh, with regard to randomness or not randomness, whether that's a level of attention that you have. And then just to get some of the last questions in the room, the virtual room, Jennifer Leung wants to think further about the whiteness of AI. You know, um, there's a lot of thoughts about medicalized exclusions in the U.S. as COVID rolls out so very, very differently in our, you know, highly disparate um, society. In any case, the traditions of other cultures is something she responds to in your work with the, you know, the yellow soup from China. Um, so anyway, those are two very different questions. How inside the black box do you as an artist want to get? And maybe Lars, if we can hear you, you'll tackle this other question about whether our machinic algorithms can expand to include these, these other traditions and these other epistemologies, which bridges to the afternoon session as well. Can we hear you? Can, can you hear me? Am I coming yep. through? Can you hear me? All right. Well, yep. I think I just, uh, to start with the black thing, I think it's uh, significant that um, uh, Andrew Pickering calls uh, speculative ethics and of the unknowable uh, because things for Pickering, relative cybernetics is always a getting on in an environment. And since uh, cybernetic, the, 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 the communication and, and uh, uh, that's privileged by, by cybernetics is the feedback loop, then feedback loop, you, you are, are always producing uh, data uh, and they do so constantly not know you can never know the final outcome so these are pro that are running in works as we know and in the, in the sort of in the, in the worldview of, of speculative cybernetics everything is networks um the the individual is a net the human brain is a network it's connected the gut as yenna's work and from and from recent science uh, so I, th I think that this idea of uh, cybernetics as the of the unknowable uh, and the great potential that lies in that um, is, important, uh, is, is an important image or figure to, uh, uh, to contrast the idea of the black box. It's a way of making the black box um, potential. That's, I, I guess, that's what she's talking about when she talks about uh, what was it you said, use things that you uh, produce your work, which is a uh, is a very humble way of, of putting it. Uh, but uh, there's the box and then there's the network. Uh, the two different yeah. kinds of two different of the unknowable. Thank you for that. I think we got the gist. So Andrew Pickering, the epistemology of the unknowable, great places to end. Uh, we're just going to pull out to the big picture on the symposium as a whole and direct our fellow participants and audience members to come to the breakout session tomorrow. And I want to take word and 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 say anything about um you know your your breakout session tomorrow and who else will be there. I think I think you'll be with Marcus maybe in that session. Yes, so we're going to speak about the wet on wet project uh in particular with Marcus. So more about that tomorrow, and hopefully some of the audience today can join join that uh, discussion as well. And hopefully the connection will be a bit better. Um, yeah. Well, I think we I think we can all embrace the very glitchy aesthetics that came out of our encounter because really <laughs> our open systems included a lot of randomness and a lot of noise, which is in the spirit of our conversation. <laughs> So for sure. with that celebration, um, I'll hope that maybe you guys can uh, come to the afternoon session with Jason Edward Lewis and Megan Fredrickson. 
where we're going to be talking about how Megan, as a biologist, uses AI to, to parse genomic relations and how Jason sees the possibility of kinship with machines. Thank you.